Are we good? All right. To each other. Oh yeah. Where do we look? Uh, where do you want to look? Okay. It's a it's a casual conversation in a, a conference booth among friends. <laughs> and we're waiting for cocktails to arrive. Right oh now. man, yes. okay, we need we them now. So. All right. Well, now we have the context. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. Are you All ready? Yep. All right. So uh, today, I'm I'm so delighted to be facilitating and moderating this panel, and we are going to be talking about avoiding bias in designing artificial intelligence in human resources and talent acquisition. What's different about this panel is that it's an all women panel, all females, yes. uh, who have experience in artificial intelligence in very different ways within the human resources and talent acquisition space. So let's go ahead. I'll start off by introducing myself and then we'll, we'll go around uh, the group. My name's Jessica Miller-Merrill. I'm the founder of Workology. And we just released a report on artificial intelligence and human resources, along with This Way Global um, and AI for Jobs, as well as MediaBot. So we'll be talking about some of those findings, but I'm interested in hearing from you guys on all things artificial intelligence. So we'll start over here on this end here with Angela Hood. All right, great. Uh, yeah, I'm Angela Hood. I'm the founder and CEO of This Way Global. Uh, we have built a suite called AI for Jobs integrates directly into ATSs and delivers unbiased matching. Awesome. Jeannie? Jean Meister, founder of Future Workplace, an HR advisory and research firm. And we developed in the last year a five-week online course called Using AI for HR to upskill the HR community on how to use artificial intelligence across the employee life cycle. Love it. I'm Chris Avrilla. I lead a practice uh, two practices for Burson Deloitte Consulting. Uh, one is around HR technology, uh, really for all consumers and buyers of HR tech. And I also do uh, have a practice for our solution providers that serve that community, all, uh, all around research advisory um, strategy um, and how to use those tools, technologies, to get the outcomes that they want. Um, specific to AI, which is something I even studied in college, um, doing much the same thing, trying to deliver outputs like uh, primers around AI and HR strategy and ways to think about how to use it. And I'm Beth White. I'm the founder and chief bot of MeBeBot. And we have a AI chatbot solution that allows employees to get their frequently asked questions answered but it's a very seamless integration with the HR team, allowing them to curate the content that's also pre-tested and tra trained against AI. Wonderful. Well, I'm so delighted to have you all on the panel. I'm looking forward to some really great conversations. We are live from the HR Technology Conference in Las Vegas, uh, which is how we are able to all get together and, and talk on this topic. So first things first, I want to talk to my analyst, HR, town acquisition experts. And so I'm gonna throw this question over uh, to you two, Jean and Chris. How have you seen artificial intelligence really evolve in the talent acquisition and human resource space in the last 24 months? I think it's exploding. And I think that here at HR Tech in Vegas, I think probably 70% at least of the talks are focused on AI and HR. We did our own survey with our members of the Future Workplace Network and that's what led us to develop the five-week course. We see that um, a growing number of companies are deploying and piloting AI for talent acquisition, for learning and development, for new hire onboarding, for coaching, and some for really cool use cases like internal talent mobility and check and documenting sexual harassment complaints, which I'll spend a little time talking about, but I think is really one of the hot, surprising use cases for AI in HR. Interesting. Um, yeah, for you know, for me, one of the one of the big trends that came out in our more recent uh, Human Capital Trends report was um, it was interesting, right? There's we're definitely seeing a lot of traction around automation, right? Um, so like a 41 percent, um, you know, of our respondents really were, yes, we're using in some way, shape, or form, for right. some particular use case, automation. 
which was a 100% increase from last year. So we're definitely getting some traction, I think, in that space. Um, you know, where I think we're seeing a lot of our respondents is in a place where, how do we start to use, you know, some of the more cognitive, you know, intelligent technologies and start to bring some of that in as well. Um, a large amount of our respondents were, you know, talking about they're going to increase their spend over the next few years. We've obviously on the provider side seeing more and more use cases, more and more applications, more things across the employee life cycle spectrum. You know, how many people are aware of it is huge. The readiness and the feeling of readiness to do it is very low. So there's a big divide there. And a little bit of an inertia because they don't understand things as yeah. well. They need the education. Everybody kind of has a different idea about what AI is much less how to apply it and how their roles actually change when you bring this in. And so we're seeing a lot of that and that's really kind of, uh, you know, supporting some of the work that we're doing, A, to start educating people and level setting, right, what this is, uh, but also how to put some strategy around this, right, so that you can kind of get the outcomes that you're looking for, what you expect, because that was another big finding that came out of our, our work was that People are buying and employing, deploying these technologies, but they're not getting the cost or the value out of it that they expected or the promise that they expected. So reframing how they go about applying technology, which we haven't really done that well over the yeah. last 20 to 30 mm -hmm. years, right? And uh, so how do we do this differently when the scale, speed, and everything else that these solutions bring, if we don't do it right, we just speed up how well we're not applying that or getting the value out of it. So that's kind of where some of this work is going. Right. Yeah. I think one of the one of the issues that isn't talked about enough is how will humans work side by side with their digital assistants, their bots. And what how do they delegate? How do they orient and how do train, they train manage feedback? Manage we haven't done that well with with People. humans, right, right. 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 <laughs> and so, and so I, I did a, an article for Forbes, it's called Humans, Gigs, and Bots, the New Blended Workforce. So you would think about blended workforce as full-time or contract, and now we now have bots as another dimension here. So it's bot engagement, right? We have employee engagement, yes, right. like bot engagement. How engaged are you with your bot? What's the experience? It, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. How yeah. does that yeah. work? Well, so now we're going to flip things around a little bit, and I want to talk to, to Angela and Beth about how they're developing these artificial intelligence technologies and the methodologies for these. Yeah. So we'll, we'll start with you, Angela. So I think like our approach has been to be very interactive with our customer and not think that we have all the answers. So we kind of start with the scientific process, like this is the hypothesis. We think this is what should work. And then we experiment a bit, we are like, okay, we're headed in the right direction. And then we check back in with customers. And a lot of times what you find is they will sacrifice a bit of outcome yep. if their workflow is not disrupted. Right. And so we're like, wait, but we can wait do minute. this thing over here. And they're like, yeah, but it messes with my workflow. Yes. Um, and so I think mm. eventually they will become more outcome focused and be willing to make some changes in behavior but we're not there yet. And we're trying so, to surface that in our work, how yeah. to do the strategy. So yes, I love exactly, it. Yeah. yeah. And so that's the first part. I think the second part is um, being mindful that diversity and bias are very significant because yes. they do drive better ROI. Now, there is a feel, hug or a, a feel good hugging moment around the topic, but really it's about things much bigger than that. And I think now that there's enough data out, I actually think Deloitte's been a huge leader in this, about actually publishing data to say uh, the ROI is there, so we have an ROI calculator. We did not ever think that we would have to uh, to create an ROI calculator to ah. explain why a company should use something. But we found that it allows uh, our users to uh, build the case, the business case, yeah, and, and also the C-suite to be able to understand it more quickly. Yeah, and say, all right, we'll take the, we'll take a chance. Uh, and we also are able to give them some benchmarks to say, this is how you know that we're succeeding because this is going to be your outcome. But that's not about development, right? This is about business yeah. process. And, yeah. Yeah. And, and getting them ready 
yes. to make that. I think, why don't you share a little bit about this ROI calculator? Okay. Like what are the assumptions yeah. in so, it? Very simply, we remove bias and then we match people to jobs, okay? And inside an applicant tracking system. And there's kind of some gymnastics around this <laughs> about how we're able to do you know, past applicants, current applicants, and so that's where a lot of the value is driven. But if you do not understand how much time is being spent looking at irrelevant resumes right now, then how do you know what your life will be like with that solution? Yeah. It's too, it's That's, the, the, the yeah. potential bad data right. on the resume side, which you have no control right. over. And then on the you know work side, right. which you may not know, right? right? You know, so how do you start to inform yes. and bring these together? Yeah. So it is actually right. doing what we need to do because machines, you know, they're pretty explicit, right? Yeah. Versus us who can maybe put a friend or do this right. or do that, right? So it's but, well, and at maybe at maybe bot too, we have the same kind of perspective because yeah. I came out of HR as a profession for 15 years, and I saw these frequently asked questions that employees ask, follow me around no matter what job I was at. Yeah. And that's also to Angela's point, HR never quantified how much of their time is spent on frequently asked questions. We don't know the work. The, yeah. the interruptions to the day, right. not only to the lack of real customer service that you're able to provide employees if that email that comes in gets lost, that someone has a very important need on, and meanwhile you look like you're ignoring this employee. So, you know, it's all about bringing that kind of consumer experience into the workplace, and why not allow a technology to kind of drive that solution? And, and so what we've done is deduce down the 200 kind of top HR FAQs. We've applied pre-tested and trained machine learning, AI, natural language processing against this data set. But the cool thing is the variable that always changes company to company yeah. is the answer. And yeah. so we've created a concept of placeholders where companies just simply change out the placeholder. That's really their unique attributes like what's your insurance provider this year and yeah. what date does open enrollment begin, et cetera. And then that flows into the curated answers. But if they don't like the way the answers are framed or you know, they want to add their own touch, they simply just go into the portal, change their answer, and they're able to deliver an answer matched to the same intent, which is what natural language processing needs to, to learn and grow. However, to Angela's point too, we apply a lot of like human supervised learning on the AI. Yeah. That's the piece that can't go under the radar. There is this it's element of AI of it, where right? we have to teach yeah. the system how to behave. And so like Angela does, we also employ a diverse work set of people at Mimibot that's looking at this data of answers that aren't returned correctly, training the bot how to respond better, and we pay a lot of close attention to it just like Angela and her team do to their data set. Yeah. And I think that's what really kind of drives a better AI experience that, that helps do what we can around the concepts of bias. So we all come with our our biases, right? Let's not go around about that, you know? Yeah. But the most we can do is employ a variety of different people that are driving the content that then is delivered back teaching the machine how to behave, so. I think it's important to talk about that supervised learning part, right? And, and I just think, you know, more and more where vendors are delivering with that black box, right? So the black box, so to speak, right? right? The kind of the Y box, right? And the fixed box. So HR professionals can understand what came behind the guidance and recommendations yeah. Yeah. or things yeah. like that so that they can train right. and fix, whether it's a fixed box there or, you know, that you guys can do it as vendors, right? So that so that, that training can happen, that feedback, that may, you know, to, to get around some of the latency effect, right, that might happen with machine learning. So right. that's kind of interesting. Yeah. So do you audit? How often do you audit? Daily. Okay. So okay. we found, uh, yeah, yeah, when we, um, in the beginning, we did not audit as frequently as we should have. And it's absolutely required because there's things that happen. I have a different version of, uh, or different view of unsupervised and supervised learning. So the way we talk about it um, is we call it gray box. Yep. So there's certain parts that we allow to be black and certain parts we allow to be white. Right. Um, but you can't have all one or the other. Uh, bias is where, when you're doing supervised learning, it's where you will bake bias into learning. 
and so you have to be very careful not to then contribute bias. It's not, this is, it's a deceptively difficult problem. Uh, and yes. that's why I tell everyone, we only do one thing, and the, the reason why is because it's a very difficult problem. Yes, yes. No, absolutely. Well, let's talk more about, about that bias, because it's, this is an all-woman panel, right? Yeah. And, and yeah. it doesn't happen very often, in, in my experience, that four really amazing, smart, accomplished women who are knowledgeable in a particular area in HR tech are speaking together. Um, even hearing uh, the AI uh, or the uh, the uh, HR tech pitch fest, uh, we had a woman leading, but she used male pronouns when she talked about male founders. She said wow. him, and it kind of caught me a little yeah. off guard. <laughs> um, and so my advice is keep them general or yeah. use female right. specifically. But I want to talk about that because even Barbara referred in the male pronouns right. for this. So how is gender bias or even racial bias being impacted in the development and then the, if supervised or unsupervised learning in in the development of HR technology that uses AI? What are, what are your points of view? So I, went, I spent a year and a half on this specific topic. So oh, wow. uh, yeah, it's a very, uh, it's a very frustrating topic. But if you can imagine if you're the prom queen or the prom king, then the systems learn that you're male or female. And over time, they learn certain companies like to hire men and women, and yeah. so the match will be like that, right? So when you go through this, you'll find that there's about 40,000 terms that are like this, waiter and waitress, and it goes on and on. So we spent a lot of time having to teach our system that men and women are both waiter and waitress, and that they are both equal. Yeah and that it doesn't need to look at that, right? So you, it, you cannot, uh, you can't be passive about it. You have to be so proactive in the technology build. But if the customer is not proactive about caring about removing the bias and diversity and inclusion, all of it falls apart. What about the words in the job descriptions? Yeah. Like, execute, yeah. I'm a executor, yeah. or I'm an optimizer. There are certain words that veer male. Yeah, well so. ninja developer is a big one, right? Yeah. So be yeah. a ninja developer or whatever. Um, and it keeps uh, talent that's very qualified from applying, and sometimes it keeps very qualified men from applying, because they're like, I don't want to work for an organization that's like that. And I think yeah. this is honestly, we do a job description workshop for our enterprise customers. It's not, it's just part of onboarding. Uh, do we want to continue to do that forever? No, <laughs> but it is a, it's necessary yeah. right now because yeah. garbage in, garbage out Absolutely. is still a thing. Yeah. Um, and so I think as long as we keep an open mind, first and foremost, you have to admit that there is bias, mm -hmm. that you have it, and that you want to do something about it. And the second that happens, you've already made 50% of the, the challenge yeah. has been met. And now you can actually start implementing technology to help you. I right? would say yeah, that yeah. every vendor should be doing these workshops. Right. And they absolutely. shouldn't be, you know, you start it and then you stop. It's because the issues are not necessarily technology no, issues, no, no. they're it's people. people issues. It's people issues, yeah. And you, it's, it's a way to onboard and, and help change mindsets yes. and and mind you know like get your head in a new spot on this so it, it should be a question actually that buyers vet potential providers on tell us about how you onboard and help us with writing these job descriptions. Yeah. Well, I think it's Jessica an important Jessica and I service. have had two workshops in yeah. Austin, Texas with HR leaders to help educate them, very specific internal HR people, to teach them a little bit about the types of systems and tools with inside HR, not talent acquisition yeah. specifically, but more the HR yeah. side, and letting them understand the things that they need to keep an eye out for if they are looking at technology, how it can help them, you know, what are different ways to get user adoption yeah. within the employee base, because that's a hard problem. It's change management, like we've talked about. You Dude. have to control it and understand like how people adopt and what's going to give them the reinforcement to continue using the solution. But really also get them to understand that they need to, this is an interactive process to be involved with the vendors that they select. Stay in the, ask the right questions. What is this system doing? How is it learning? How, how are you teaching it to behave like this? 
And, you know, I was an HR again. I think other HR people can learn this. You don't have to be a PhD scientist to understand the core, you know, content. And so I, you know, I'm trying to empower, like you are too, yeah. team, just empower and upskill HR to understand that this is going to be one part of their job, whether they like yeah. it or not. Yeah. Yeah. The sooner you can embrace it, the better. Yeah. And once you embrace it, you'll be like, oh my God, I have this great extra time that now I can really focus on some of the compensation pay equity yeah. issues. You know, deal with some of the the higher level kind of strategies around talent acquisition in a very tight labor market. Yes. Uh, we want to get people out from under the noise of, of um, the, what I call the low-hanging fruit types of problems like yeah. FAQ that have been following us around for forever. Yeah. And it's a really easy path to start on HI, AI, yeah. start learning some core concepts like natural language processing, and then you'll start to really understand how the rest of the algorithms and the back-end data start to work. So just start easing it in. Kind of like the first time you started using your Siri. You know, I always equate it with that. People didn't know they were using AI, right? But that's really the basis of it. The thing I love about your question, though, is, you know, it, it really is about outcomes, right? Like, we're trying to solve for some problems, but we get kind of lost in the, yeah. you know, in the inertia. And then we have some unintended consequences, sure. right, that come out of it. And right. so the power of this technology you know, is is such that you know it can take whatever path that you're on and go faster and bigger and broader, at it, right? So if you know, I ran a panel yesterday at the Women in Technology Summit around you know gender diversity and pay equity, and and part of what that was about was you know how do we leverage technology, right? And I'm like, why are we still having this conversation? It's 2019, <laughs> right? Right, but. Yeah. But it means right. we keep losing focus on what the outcomes are, right? right? So a lot of the work that I'm doing is, again, what's a framework around looking at this from a strategic perspective and what we're trying to accomplish? And if it is, we got to stop doing the checkboxes of gender diversity and figure yeah. out why we're trying to do it. We want to remain competitive for talent. We right. want to be able to yep. be competitive against business model threats. That's and, right. And threats to, you know, to what the business could be, competition, model, whatever, right? right. But I think it, the important discussion here is to reframe the mindset of, mm -hmm. of HR is we're, we're now not talking about strategic business partnering anymore. We're talking no. about strategic leadership. And mm -hmm. that is how do we leverage talent to get to some of these big business issues, right? And we're not going to be competitive for talent when you don't have a, a, a workforce that doesn't look like, you know, your customers. The, the, your that's customers. Right. Exactly. Like that, that's right. that's yeah. exactly it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so why are we doing this? And we want to be innovative, right? Well, to be innovative, you have to have cognitive diversity and all of these things, right? Looking at it from a lot of different perspectives. So again, what are your outcomes? What are you trying to do? And then you can start to back into it. And then when the black, you know, the black box is there, that's why that Y box and fix box is so important. Mm -hmm. So you can keep your eye on the North Star, right? right. That you're trying to get to. And that you're formulating, and is this happening? Is this working? Are we, you know, are we getting that kind of diversity? Do we even have a framework for how to bring in different schools of thought when we're trying to hire for culture fit all the time, which typically means we all agree, right? right. Or that everybody yeah. looks like us. Exactly. Yeah. It's basically so culture I think, you know, fit. again, what is culture it we're trying fit. to accomplish? And then all of our actions, tools, process, human experience, what we're trying to, you know, to journey map through. But it is, it does mean that we have to reskill ourselves, right. and that's a lot of what the writing is too. How do you prepare for what it means to be in HR going in the future with all these technologies, right? Um, but also, what does it mean and how do we go about it? It's interesting because HR in itself is sort of the cobbler, has no shoes. Like, yeah. we all just focus on everyone else but not ourselves, and what you're saying is, like, we're treating the symptoms, but we need to take a look at the diagnosis yeah. and then be it really preventative. Before yes. we can do it yeah, across right. yeah, the Absolutely. Yeah, but right. we, then we have to lead people through that, right? right? But we have to do it, you know, on ourselves first, and then, you know, we can take that through the enterprise. That's, that's, that's extremely challenging and hard. Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit more about biases and, and, and think a little bit about AI. Where is our biases most vulnerable? 
when it comes to developing or maybe implementing or beginning with, with artificial intelligence? I'm going to start with Beth yeah. on, on this side. So. Yeah. yeah, no, biases I think are just, again, there's a lot of data out there and again, working in HR, I've seen poor handling of data and it's not to point fingers at anybody in HR, it's just hard to manage all that information that's coming in. Yeah. So I think a lot of times you do have to think through the cruddy data in, cruddy data out scenario. Yeah. And so I think some of the challenges are, um, when I look at some of the vendors that are applying predictive analytics to the data sets, that are in existence within an HR team's ecosystem, I get a little worried because I ask them very seriously, have you ever asked the HR people how they actually collect that data and ongoingly maintain that data? Because if you're applying these algorithms out here to do things like predictive analytics around turnover, like how can you predict somebody before they leave the organization? You know, unless you're really checking all the boxes about the quality of the data, and I think that's what scares a lot of HR people into getting started in leveraging AI technologies, is they throw up their hands and like, now we have to fix all the data. We gotta cleanse all the data. And there is an element of yes to that. However, start also thinking through strategies to get rid of other things that may be you know, compromising your time so you can turn more time and attention to getting your data in order so that you can start to collect it better in the future and also put these algorithms to it in an applicable way that it actually makes sense. Yeah. I, I think that we have to be prepared for the employee activism around this yes. issue. And by that, I mean, you know, employees are going to demand answers to questions like, what are you doing with the data? How long are you keeping the data? Um, can I see what you have? How are you communicating? And who are you communicating with this data? And, and I think that this whole thing is, because it's so new, a lot of HR departments haven't understood how to use AI in an ethical and responsible yes. way. And I, I really think that 2020 and 2021, that is the microscope is going to be on how are we collecting, disseminating, using it. And on top of that, we see a lot of new laws, right? We see laws emerging um, in the state of Illinois regarding AI for video interviewing mm -hmm. platforms, right? Where, where you know, they're gonna have to report what they're doing with it and how long they're keeping it, which is key. Right. right? So there's some real issue, right? And I love that you said, you know, on the using side, because here's the thing, right? We, you know, what you said is absolutely true. We've got to be prepared, the data, you know, garbage in, garbage out, that we've talked about, right? But it's how we use it that is going to be a really big challenge because we've never had to be intentional or really look at somebody's actions. So flight risk is a great example, right? What do I do with that data when I know it, right? I may know it inherently. I may know that, you know, that Jessica is a flight risk. Like I yeah. may, you know, I can see it, she's not engaged or whatever, right? How I act as her manager, right. nobody's watching that. I've made that assumption. Yeah. I am I am acting appropriately or inappropriately based on that action, right? So we've never had to be intentional when it's humans. We have to be more intentional when we're getting guidance from a machine, uh, right? right? What from do you do a, yeah, what do you do with it? But now that it's out there in black and white, it's discoverable, right? And right. now people are watching what you do with this information, and you know. And so we've never really had to be very, uh, you know, focused, intentional, like with here's what happens when this happens, mm -hmm. right? And and that's work. Like what, you know, what we do with that data. It's a new job role. It's a perhaps, new job role. Right? So there is going to be like a, a whole engineering, you know, component to what we do with this, how we do it, being intentional about it, what's appropriate, what's not appropriate. And the fact that everything will be watched from there by the employee, by laws, by yeah. whatever, yeah. right? So we're not used to that muscle set around 
how do we think through everything? Because AI today, especially in supervised learning, right, is is statistics and decision trees and all of that, right? We're not used to doing that as humans, yeah. right? So it, it's going to be an interesting, yeah, no. interesting, Time's you know, ahead. how do we prepare for this and get ahead of the unintended consequences that can right. happen, yeah. right? Yeah. We're starting to provide just some real-time data and analytics to yeah. simple things like the chatbot interactions, yeah. which is what we can provide on our dashboard. Just gives people a hint and a sense that there is this information, start to process yeah. it, think about you know how it could be actionable. Because I, I love a friend of mine always says, HR's always lived in autopsy days of data. <laughs> and it's like, it is true, it's dead data. It's data that we're yeah. always looking back at looking like back a towards, turnover right. report. Yeah. I can't do anything about it. It already right. happened. It's right. done. Right. And so it's getting HR to yeah. start thinking in the way that I worked in the retail tech industry for a while. The way retailers think about real-time data about their consumers. Right. They have buying patterns and shopping patterns and right. they understand these kind of behaviors and they've embraced it to add to a way to drive in a new Consumer experience. Yeah. We should think about it from, a service, we, from a service delivery, right? What it, to yeah. our employees? If you're experience. asking me this, have you what thought you, about this? Exactly, you know, we don't exactly. do that as humans. We just answer the questions that's sometimes. Right. But, but that consumer grade experience exactly. that you're talking about is, if you're asking me about this, there's probably a few other things that you might want. Have you thought about this? Ask yeah. about that. So that's I right. love that. Mm -hmm. So let's kind of wind down here. Want us to think about kind no. of. I know, no, it's been so fun. much fun. This is great. It has been so much fun. First of all, thank you, Jessica. Thank you. No, thank you for thank you. thank you for being a part of this. Like again, some of my favorite people that uh, new and old friends or yeah. seasoned or friends, very right? Seasoned. Yeah. <laughs> uh, very seasoned. Who are friendships. doing really amazing things yeah. parallel to each other and I want to be supportive of those as women in an industry that is predominantly women but it's driven by technology that is predominantly male driven. So I guess let's let's end with this, just maybe one piece of advice for somebody uh, who is either developing or looking at buying artificial intelligence technology, you can take your pick, who the audience that you want to talk to before we close things down. Um, all right, I'll start, but I do want to say one thing about what we were just talking about. Yeah. I think we need to make part of our core values as a company is around the topic we just discussed. Yes, absolutely. Yep. So, like, because if you do not instill that at the top, at the top level, but that's good highest advice. level. Yeah, that is absolutely. absolutely yeah. But it, when you do that, right. it changes things. Yes. So it I does. just want to say that. Um, yeah. So I think um, from um, applicant tracking perspective, I, I hear um, we see people all day, every day, coming in the booth and saying we want to adopt this technology, but we use X or Y applicant tracking system. And the applicant tracking systems are kind of confounded. They're like, do we bring in technology to enable our customers to do things that are outside of our system? And the, the truth is that the customer is going to win. They're going to win for themselves. They are going to go to whoever has mm -hmm. the thing that they need. And so I think that there needs to be a little bit more of an open mindset about how we all work together in partnership uh, and regardless of male, female, regardless of what kind of applicant tracking system is, because ultimately candidates um, deserve a, an ability to work, an ability to put food on the table. And when we do not work together, we prohibit that. Mm -hmm. And so if we all work at that level, then the rest of the stuff will get sorted out. I love it. And have a good experience along yeah. the way too, right? Yeah. So, um, so I think we have to focus on how this technology AI can create a more human workplace experience. And, and I think for that, I'm thinking about, I had a panel yesterday on reimagining HR and the age of AI, and on my panel were Delta and Hilton, where they publicly said, actually, about 99% of the people that come to us through our career site and apply do not get a job. So I think we have to do a better job as HR leaders on developing more emotional intelligence for the candidate. How do we give back to the candidate? If we're not going to move forward with that candidate and we have some interesting data on what are their skill sets or what new skills they should develop, how do we provide that back to them Help so them. that we're creating a more human 
workplace experience. Yeah. It's great yeah. for the candidate experience and the culture yeah. and the organization yeah. too. Yeah. So yeah. everybody wins. Yeah. You know, and, and this may sound you know, kind of like a shameless plug, but the body of work that I'm trying to do is is around the nuggets of advice. Because you know, Jessica, I've been doing this work for a long time, yeah. right? And so for me, you know, my advice is stay focused on the outcomes, you know, you know, make sure you're aligned, right, with what the business objectives are, right? Um, and then make sure whatever you're bringing in is gonna get you to where you need to be, right? Um, I do think there's a good bit of advice that I would give HR professionals and writing about this too. And you know, between the tech strategy work and the AI and HR work, there's also some work about how do we disrupt ourselves, right? Yeah. Um, you know, what is what are the muscles that we need to to build? And where can we get help doing that, right? You know, we need some help. It's like going to the gym, right? You know, you don't want to go into the gym and just start working out and you don't know the technique or you don't know, you know what I mean? You yep. see, while you're building those muscles, get the help to do it that you need to. And, and then the other side is, you know, and design thinking is a, be, is a big, huge part of this because we have bought systems for us for so long, for HR, right? And not for who our customers are, which is everybody. Right, like every employee touches these systems, and how, and why, and you know all of these things. So understanding that, with, along with the business outcomes, but also with that, that kind of that human experience that you're talking about. You know, what is that? How do you stay focused on that? And how do you utilize this technology to, you know, to kind of get you to those outcomes? So. Yeah. No, I think that's fabulous advice, and I love that you mentioned design thinking. Yeah. Uh, we've actually incorporated some design thinking in this workshop that we've done. It's interesting because in software development, they've thought about design thinking and the concepts of empathy for the for the user, understanding the process of iteration, and the biggest thing that I would love more HR people to embrace is understand that when you buy technology, ask the right questions, talk to a lot of vendors, and understand that you're part of the solution. Like the vendor will get better if you iterate with them, give them feedback. This is how AI works, it's a learning process. And so that it's not just plug it in out of the box and go like this and walk away. This is an ongoing commitment that you're making to have this technology be part of your team now. It really is, if it's going to solve some of the work problems for your team, incorporate it into your team and understand that you're you're constantly massaging and working with it, as well as hopefully your vendor yeah. partner. Right, yeah. It should be a really nice partnership at well, the end of the day. Well, design thinking is a, is a complex business problem solving methodology, right? Yep. And we're innovating. We're going where nobody else has gone. Mm -hmm. The reason it's important is, is a, it's also a risk reduction mm -hmm. methodology, right? right? It reduces, you know, if you if you stick to that structured process, right? This is how we innovate. If nobody else has done it, you know, we're going where nobody else has gone before. We need to understand what the customer needs are, yes. but we also have to reduce the risk of the idea, what's mm -hmm. desirable, what is it we're trying to accomplish with that outcome, right? But what's feasible, what can we actually build, right? And mm -hmm. so there's the iterations kind of get through that right. that feasibility, you know, that feasibility risk, but what can we profitably deliver or at least fund so that we're getting the value out of it and, that's, and right. that's the risk of execution that you can mitigate through that. So it's it's good skills to have. So we're gonna Close this down, but thank you, ladies, for Absolutely. taking the time to talk Everybody. with us today. Love thank it. you very much. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Jessica.